run by our elected representatives, what they get up to on the ground and as legislators to serve us and the constituents who elect them. Today's guest has this week been elected as chair of the Influential Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee in the House of Commons and, as well as having served in various ministerial positions, represents a rural Yorkshire constituency and continues to be a voice for his community. Delighted to say the MP for Scarborough and Whitby, Sir Robert Goodwill, joins us now. Hi, Robert. Thank you for joining Hi, us. Morning. So it's been an exciting week for you. Yes, I mean, it was a hotly contested election. There were uh, five candidates went forward and it, it went down to the line. The, 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 they were eliminated in turn and, and at the end there were just two standing. And I, I got it um, at the end actually by, by a reasonable margin. But uh, yes, it was a, an exciting campaign. I'm really pleased to have been elected and got the confidence of my, of my colleagues because it's a really um, difficult time, an exciting time, a challenging time for agriculture, for the environment and, of course, for the fishing industry as, as the transition goes through to uh, controlling more of our waters. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things, Robert, about select committees is how they are so different from what a lot of people see happening in Westminster. You know, they see the punch and Judy politics of sort of prime minister's question time. But it's not like that at all on select committees usually, is it? No, I mean, it's, it's um, we, we, we gain evidence. This, this is not about the members sort of themselves politically grandstanding. It's about getting experts in, getting ministers before the committee and, and actually producing detailed reports with recommendations to the government. And, you know, for a select committee to be successful, it had to be genuinely cross-party and try and keep everybody together. Uh, occasionally, committees can't agree and they, they end up with sort of minority reports being published by one side. But I think my job as the committee chair is to keep everybody uh, working together and, and in particular, I think, shining a very bright light on, on, on government ministers into those sort of dark crevices of government policy that we can explore. Now, you've been an MP for, for a while now, Robert. What are some of the, the kind of key lessons you've learned? If you could kind of go back and speak to yourself on day one, what advice would you give? Well, I mean, the first thing when you get elected, and, and I took my seat like you from from the Labour Party um, in uh, in 2005. Uh, they'd had a Labour MP for eight years. The main thing is, is to get dug in in your own constituency, you know, make sure that you're well known, get involved with local organisations. And most importantly, I think, to make sure that you have a good team of, of staff, caseworkers dealing with those problems, because a lot of people come to an MP if they've got a problem with housing, with benefits. Recently, we've been working with constituents who are adopting or, or, or making homes for Ukrainians and trying to sort out those visas. So, you know, there, there's a lot of hard work. And if you've got a good team behind you, they can deal with those everyday problems so that people know if they come to the MP, we can sort of, um, you know, if you write to an organisation, it pretty much gets to the top of that organisation if the letter comes from an MP. And, and similarly, if we contact a minister, they know if, if the MP isn't satisfied with the response, we can always stand up in Parliament and raise it uh, in the chamber. So, you know, generally speaking, MPs can get problems sorted for constituents. And what are some of your proudest achievements in the time that, in which you've been an MP? Well, I, I think at the Department for Transport, where I was in the opposition transport team, and we, we managed to get some, uh, I got some policies into the manifesto. Uh, one on drug driving. In, in, in the old days, if, if a policeman stopped somebody for, for drug driving, they had to sort of make them close their eyes and touch their nose or, or walk along a line at the side of the road. And uh, I um, introduced uh, the idea that we should have a drug eliza. So now every time I read somebody's been done for drug driving in the paper, I think, well, that probably wouldn't ha have happened had it not been for what we've done. And the other thing uh, at transport was the HGV levy. So uh, foreign trucks didn't used to have to pay to use our roads. Uh, we, you know, British trucks pay quite a lot of money for their vehicle excise duty. So we introduced that, and that's raised over three hundred million pounds uh, since it was introduced. So when when people say MP should be paid on results, uh, I'd be happy to take one percent of that. <laughs> well, Robert, you, you've been a front bencher and a back bencher. How does it compare and which do you prefer? Uh, well, it, it, it's always nice to be a minister because you're actually in the driving seat. You can make decisions, sometimes quite frustrating because there's things you, you might want to do that, that you, you can't sort of uh, get your colleagues to agree to. But, yeah, I mean, being in the driving seat, being a minister is, is, is really uh, exciting and interesting. But then, you know, as chairing a select committee, as I will be doing starting a week on Tuesday, then, you know, we are able to, you know, 
get issues raised. Uh, look at some of the real challenges. I mean, food, who, who would have thought, you know, a year ago that we'd been worried about whether there was enough food in the world to feed everybody? And now with the situation in Ukraine, we need to look at how our new environmental policies that we're bringing in under the new freedoms we have outside the European Union, how they can actually ensure that we can still produce the, the food we need to feed not only this country, but much of the developing world. So are you planning to do work around food security on the committee? Yes, I mean, we, we've got a number of reports that we're doing at the moment, which we'll need to finish. But then, you know, in consultation with my colleagues, I think one of the issues we need to look at is is how we can, as a country, become more self-sufficient in the food we produce. In the, Well, obviously, we're never going to produce bananas and mangoes, but, you know, the sort of food we can produce, how we can produce more. And at the same time, uh, deliver sustainable agriculture, because you know, what we don't want to have is a, an agricultural industry that doesn't contribute to our net zero obligations, that doesn't improve the, the way that our soils, uh, air quality uh, and animal welfare. So I think we need to be able to see if we can deliver all those things in parallel. But I think the focus is, is more than ever before on how we can produce uh, adequate supplies of food in this country. I mean, you know, for example, um, in my constituency, we have the, the McCain chip factory, the, the famous oven chips are produced in Scarborough. And they've now had to switch from using sunflower oil, which majority of which came from Ukraine, to uh, using a combination of rapeseed oil and uh, sunflower oil. So, you know, the changes will have to be made. We'll have to look at how we do uh, supply those foods and how we can improve our carbon footprint of agriculture. Brilliant. Well, Robert, thank you so much for your time this morning and sharing your insights. And uh, I think once you've got into the job, we'd love to have you back on to talk about some of those inquiries that your committee is running as well. Robert Goodwood there. Thank you very MP much. For hey, not at all, Robert. Thank you. MP for Scarborough and Whitby and now chair of the EFRA Select Committee.